Hello Year 7 and welcome back to your home learning videos. I hope that you have had a lovely half term and that you're feeling very well rested but that means that you're ready to get back to it and do some really hard work in English. So today we're going to be continuing with the boy scheme of work and so in order to complete these lessons you will need your copy of boy whether that's your physical book copy, the audio book that you can find on YouTube or the PDF copy that is linked on show my homework and you will also need your boy home learning booklet. Now hopefully you've been saving it to your user as you've been going um, but if you haven't been and you need to download that again, like I said, you can find that on Show My Homework. Today we're actually going to be looking at a different autobiography to Boy, and we're looking at the autobiography that's titled Cider with Rosie. We're going to be comparing Laurie Lee's school experiences with that of Roald Dahl. So we're going to be thinking about Laurie Lee, he's a famous poet, we're going to be thinking about his autobiography and his experiences at school, and we're going to be comparing that to that of Roald Dahl. Now you might be thinking Cider with Rosie is a bit of a strange name for an autobiography, so hopefully we'll find out later on why that is, has been titled so. But Cider with Rosie was written by Laurie Lee, and it's also an autobiography set around the same time as Boy. And while the Dahl family were quite wealthy, you might remember from a number of lessons ago, I spoke about how they had a very nice house, a very big house in the countryside, the Lee family were much poorer. So Laurie Lee was alive from 1914 to 1997, and then Doral Dahl was alive from 1916 to 1990. So really not much difference in their lifespans at all, and they were children at roughly around the same time. Lee's mother, like Roald Dahl's, had lots of children and no husband to help her. Unlike Mr Dahl, who died, Mr Lee abandoned his wife and children. Mrs Lee raised all of the children alone, just like Mrs Dahl. Then the Lee family lived in Slad, just outside of Stroud. Slad is still called Cider with Rosy Country, so based on his autobiography it's now famously known as Cider with Rosy Country and you can see where we've got Purton on the map there, uh, Slad isn't actually too far from Purton and in fact it's in um, the county Gloucestershire which is not too far from Wiltshire at all just bordering. So we're going to look at an extract from the side with Rosie. The extract we're going to read today is from Laurie Lee's first day of school. His sisters call him Lol, that's like a nickname for him, his name is Laurie. Using examples from the text, we're going to be thinking about how this school is different to nowadays and how it's the same. So are there any similarities? Are there any differences? Now I'm going to read out the extract to you and you've also got a copy of it in your booklet. So you can go flick to your booklet and you can read along as I'm reading. So an extract from, from Cider with Rosie by Laurie Lee. The village school at that time provided all the instruction we were likely to ask for. It was a small stone barn divided by a wooden partition into two rooms, the infants and the big ones. There was one dame teacher and perhaps a young girl assistant. Every child in the valley crowding there remained till he was 14 years old. Then he was presented to the working field or factory with nothing in his head more burdensome than a few mnemonics, a jumbled list of wars, a dreamy image of the world's geography. It seemed enough to get, on, get by with in any case, and it was up, one up on our poor grandparents. So you can see that Laurie is saying there that actually they didn't leave school with very much knowledge at all, but it was still more than what his grandparents learnt when they were his age. This school, when I came to it, was at its peak. Universal education and unusual fertility had packed it to the walls with pupils. Wild boys and girls from miles around, from the outlying farms and half-hidden hovels way up at the ends of the valley, swept down each day to add to our numbers, bringing them with, with them strange oaths and odours, quaint garments and curious pies. They were my first amazed vision of any world outside my family. I didn't expect it to survive it so long. I was confronted with it at the age of four. The morning came without any warning, when my sister surrounded me, wrapped me in scarves, tied up my bootlaces, thrust a cap on my head and stuffed a baked potato in my pocket. What's this? I said. You're starting school today. I ain't. I'm stopping home. No, come on, lol. You're a big boy now. I ain't. You are. Boo-hoo. They picked me up bodily, kicking and bawling, and carried me up the road. Boys who don't go to school get put into boxes and turned into rabbits and get chopped up some Sundays. I thought this was overdoing it rather, but I said no more after that. I arrived at the school just three feet tall and fatly wrapped in my scarves. The playground roared like a rodeo and the potato burned through my thigh. Old boots, ragged sockings, torn trousers and skirts went skating and skidding around me. The rabble closed in. I was encircled. Grit flew in my face like shrapnel. Tall girls with frizzled hair and huge boys with sharp elbows began to prod me with hideous interest. They plucked at my scarf, spun me around like a top, screwed my nose and stole my potato. 
I was rescued at last by a gracious lady, the sixteen-year-old junior teacher, who boxed a few ears and dried my face and led me off to the infants. I spent that first day picking holes in paper, then went home in a smouldering temper. What's the matter, lol? Didn't you like it at school, then? They never gave me the present. What present? What present? They said they'd give me a present. Well, now I'm sure they didn't. They did. They said, you're Laurie Lee, ain't ya? Well, just you sit here for the present. I sat there all day, but I never got it, and I ain't ever going back there again. But after a week, I felt like a veteran and grew as ruthless as anyone else. Somebody had stolen my baked potato, so I swiped someone else's apple. The infant room was packed with toys such as I'd never seen before. Coloured shapes and rolls of clay, stuffed birds and men to paint. Also, a frame of counting beads, which a young teacher played like a harp, guiding our wandering fingers. Okay, so that was the extract from Cider with Rosie then. And as you can see, to begin with, Lol really didn't like his school. He didn't want to go back, but then he ended up going back and he felt he describes himself feeling like a veteran. So he was very experienced, even by the end of the first week. Right, so we're going to use some images now. So we can use the images on the next few slides to discuss the effect of a few phrases that Laurie Lee has used. So these images that are going to be on the slides represent sentences and quotations from the extract of Side of Rove Rosie. And we're going to be thinking about what the effect is of these sentences. Now, all writers, and in this case, Laurie Lee, use every sentence for an effect. They want to be really careful with their words. They don't want to be waffling on because then people would say they're not a very good writer. So every single word that Laurie Lee has chosen to include in his autobiography has been carefully chosen to have a specific effect on the audience. So whether that's to make us laugh, whether that's to make us feel sympathy for him, maybe whether it's to make us feel really sad for him, we'll find out. So this first one, the playground roared like a rodeo. And there's the picture on the left there, if you haven't seen what a rodeo is, you can see the cowboy there riding the horse like a, um, a rodeo. So the playground roared like a rodeo. So I want you to have a think. Can you recognise what technique, what writer's method Laurie Lee has used there? And what does that make the playground sound like? What does it make the playground feel like for us as readers? And how do we imagine Laurie Lee feels in that moment? Old boots, ragged stockings, torn trousers went skating and skidding around me. So again, I want you to think, if they're old boots, they're ragged stockings, they're torn trousers and skirts, maybe that links to what I told you about the context of the autobiography earlier and the fact that Laurie Lee's family were quite poor, they came from a quite a poor area, um, and the fact that they're skidding and skating around him, what does that suggest about the playground? Is it busy? Is it empty? How do we feel for him? How does he feel in that moment? Grit flew in my face like shrapnel. So if you've never seen that word before, shrapnel, you can see the picture on the left there is um, examples of shrapnel. So shrapnel is like scars and um, shards of metal um, and it's going to be really painful for it to be fl flying in his face. You often hear about the shrapnel from bullets, the bullet casings. So if something breaks, you might imagine like a tyre bursting. If a tyre bursts then bits of it will fly off like shrapnel. And it's the grit from the playground, it's flying in his face. So really think about how, what the effect is of that sentence. It's almost it's explain, comparing it to a really painful experience. Spun me around like a top. And you might think, well, what on earth is a top? What's Miss talking about? And you can see the pictures on here, it's a spinning top. So they spun him around like a top. And again, you might be able to figure out what method Laurie Lee has used in that sentence. Um, if they've spun him around to the top, maybe he feels really dizzy. Maybe he feels really disorientated. Okay, so we're going to look at this extract in particular. So I'm going to read it out. And then in your home learning booklet, you've got a table. And we're going to use this table to examine the phrases from the description. And I'll come to that in a minute. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. I thought this was overdoing it rather, but I said no more after that. I arrived at the school just three feet tall and fatly wrapped in my scarves. The playground roared like a rodeo, and the potato burned through my thigh. Old boots, ragged stockings, torn trousers and skirts went skating and skidding around me. The rabble closed in. I was encircled. Grit flew in my face like shrapnel. Tall girls with frizzled hair and huge boys with sharp elbows began to prod me with hideous interest. They plucked at my scarves, spun me around like a top, screwed my nose and stole my potato. I think it's quite funny that he's taken a hot potato with him for lunch. I'm assuming it's for lunch. And he's got it in his pocket and someone's stolen it from him. 
Okay, so we read the extract. Now what you need to do, and you can see your table in your book, there's a point column, there's a quotation column, and there's an analysis column. I'm going to use this table to help us plan for a PQA, so point, quotation, analysis. So it says point here, method that the writer uses. Now you've got the quotations, there are four in total, and the first one's been done for you, so you've only got three more to do. You need to try and work out which technique, which method the writer uses in each of those quotations. So Old boots, ragged stockings, torn trousers and skirts were skating and skidding around me. So see if you can work out what technique is there. I'll give you a clue. Look at the letters at the beginning of some of those words. Then have a think. What is this? What is the effect of that technique? Why does he use that technique? What does it make it sound like? Is it a pleasant experience? Is it a chaotic experience? Some hints for you there. The next one, grit flew in my face like shrapnel. So again, I spoke about the fact that it is a very painful experience. You can see there are some examples on that table for you. And you've not just zoomed in on one word. So, for example, in the um, first row, the playground roared like a rodeo. We haven't just zoomed in on the word roared, meaning a loud noise like a wild animal. We've also zoomed in on the word rodeo. So uh, rodeo is a show for taming wild horses. So the idea that there's a roar, which makes us think of a lion or other wild animals, and then the rodeo, which is for taming wild animals. So how, what is Laurie Lee comparing the school children to in this case? Then I want you to have a think about um, the grit flew in my face like shrapnel. What is the effect of that word flu? What is the effect of that word shrapnel? You can see the ones that have been underlined. They're the ones that we should be zooming in on and thinking about the technique that's been used. They spun me around like a top. What does that suggest? Maybe he's like a little toy for them. Think about the way that they're all gathered around him and they're all interested to play with him. In fact, it says that they began to prod him with hideous interest. So think about the fact that they're almost like acting like he's a new toy that they've got to play with and they've spun him around like one. So you need to pause the video so you can fill in that table. There are lots of hints on there for you. The first row has been done. You need to think about the techniques that are used. And also you need to think about what the underlined words and what the effect of is of those underlined words. Now, as I said earlier, Laurie Lee has chosen every single one of these words to have a specific effect. I want you to think about what the effect of these word choices are. Now, what I'd like you to do is try and turn your table into a PQA. There's an example on the board there for you. Laurie leaves a simile to describe his first day at school. He says the playground roared like a rodeo. The verb roared makes, roared makes the reader think of a loud noise from a predator like a lion. Perhaps he was frightened by the sound of the school. The noun rodeo is a sport where wild horses are tamed by cowboys. This suggests that the school is full of wild animals that Laurie Lee finds intimidating. Now you can see that we haven't just said Laurie Lee thinks school is scary. He uses a simile to show this. We've zoomed in on the different word choices that Laurie's made, thought about the verb roared, thought about the noun rodeo, and we're thinking in more detail about what the effect of these words are. How does it make him feel? And maybe how does it make us feel as a reader? Maybe you could um, extend your PQA a little bit more by thinking about um, how we feel sympathy for him maybe it's going your first day at school is a very scary experience for some people maybe that makes us feel very sympathetic towards him so when you've done your table pick one of those rows perhaps the one you feel most confident in if you really want to challenge yourself you could do the one that you're least confident in and see if you can write a pqa here um, and this will be good practice because next lesson the next one on this um video um you're going to be writing three pqas and then perhaps sending them off your teacher if you want some feedback so this will be very good practice for that so have a think and see if you can turn one of those rows into a pqa similar to my one on the powerpoint And finally, I want you to think back to Roald Dahl's school, St. Peter's. How are Dahl and Lee's schools different? So how are their school experiences different? What do they think about school? You might need to go back and reread that chapter if you haven't read it since before half term. And it won't take very long, I'm sure. They're quite short chapters. So go back and you can reread that one maybe. And then think, which school is the most similar to modern education? Now, as I said, they were probably at school at roughly around the same time, but they are very different still. So which school is most similar to modern education? Is it Darl's school, St. Peter's, or was it Laurie Lee's school? I want you to have a think about that question. When you've done that, you have finished this video, so you can pause it and come back to it tomorrow, come back to it another day, or you can continue through and do all three English lessons in one go. It's entirely up to you.
Okay, so next lesson then, this is lesson 17, and today we're going to be looking at the matron. So our learning objective is to practice RPQA ready for an assessed piece. Now I mentioned last lesson that hopefully you will finish this lesson have with PQAs to email to your English teachers, um, but if you are any unsure about them or you're finding it difficult at all, then you can always email your English teachers to ask for help. So as I've mentioned before, please don't be shy about emailing your teachers. We are all desperate to hear from you and and looking forward to receiving some wonderful PQA. So if you are stuck at all, please make sure you ask your English teacher for help. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to play a quick game. And on your home learning booklet, you've got um, a table, another table, and you've got one, two, three, four, five quotations from Boy that we have read so far. And we're going to be thinking about with these five quotations, which grown up is being described. OK, so I want you to have a think. Think back to the bits that you've read earlier. Can you figure out which grown up is being described in each of these five quotations? And no cheating, so I'm going to show you the answers at the end. I want you to write them in your grid and see if you get them right, and then you can give yourself a ticker across. Okay, so the first one she was a white haired, wrinkly faced old bird who seemed always to be sitting in her rocking chair. So let's have a think who's that? Can you figure out who it is? White haired, old bird. See if you can figure that one out. Number two, a giant of a man with a face like a ham and a mass of rusty coloured hair that sprouted in a tangle all over the top of his head. OK, that's number two for you. A giant of a man with a rusty coloured hair. So write in your grid which one you think that is. Who is that? Number three, a small skinny old hag with a moustache on her upper lip and a mouth as sour as a green gooseberry. So write in your table, who do you think that is? A small skinny old hag. I want to hear any rude comments about any of your teachers. A small skinny old hag. Right, <laughs> number four. Over the years, he taught himself to do more or less anything he wanted with just the four fingers and thumbs of his right hand. He could tie a shoelace as quickly as you or me. Okay, so that one's from right at the beginning of the autobiography. See if you can figure that one out. Might need to flick back through if you're stuck, but no cheating. I want to show you the answers in a minute. And last but not least, number five, he shook me by the hand. And when he did so, he gave me the kind of flashing grin a shark might give to a small fish just before he gobbles it up. So I might try and think, who is that? He gave me the kind of flashing grin a shark might give to a small fish just before he gobbles it up. Okay, if you haven't figured them out and you want to go back, feel free to go back or pause, and pause the video. See if you can figure them out. And then I'm going to show you the answers. Right, the answers then. The first one is Bestie Mama, so that's Roldar's grandma from Norway. The second one is Mr. Coombs, his first head teacher from Landalf Cathedral School. Um, he's his headmaster. Number three is Mrs. Patrick, Mrs. Pratchett, of course, it is the skinny old hag. Number four is Harold Dahl, so that is um, Roldar's father. And number five is the headmaster at St. Peter's, so his newest headmaster, okay, the one that grinned at him like a shark. Now, we need to have a think. Do you notice any themes emerging with Roald Dahl's view of adults? Are most of them presented in a positive way or a negative way? Or could you try and be a little bit more concise and think which ones are presented in a positive way? Is it, are, is it his relatives? Is it people in positions of authority? Maybe the sweet shop owner, the, his headmasters? Think about the way that they're presented. Is it consistent all the way through? Does Roald Dahl generally think that adults are nice people or not very nice people? Maybe see if you can compare that to any Roald Dahl books that you might have read at primary school or if you're a big Roald Dahl fan you might have read lots of his books and you might know that actually overall he has quite a consistent view on adults and I want you to have a think is it a positive view or is it a negative view? What does he think of them? OK, next we're going to be reading the chapter The Matron. And as we read, I'd like you to try and highlight memorable quotes about The Matron. Now, I have had quite a few emails from students telling me that they can't highlight because they don't have their own physical copy. There is the highlight function available um, on Word. So if you've got extracts on Word and you need to highlight, you could just highlight on your home learning booklet on Word. But if you've got, if you're using the PDF or the audiobook copy and you're wondering, like, how am I going to highlight the memorable quotes about the matron? You could always just open another Word document and then write them down or type them up. 
okay well just because it says highlight you don't have to say that literally it just means making a note to yourself and if you have got your book copy the easiest way to do that is to write in the book or to label them but if that's not available to you then you need to come up with the best kind of best case scenario is that you write them down somewhere you make a little list of the memorable quotes so I think some of you need to be a little bit more resilient with that just because the instructions say highlight it doesn't mean you can't do it in a different way it's just making sure that you know that the quotations are um, there and you know which quotations are the important ones so like I said if you're stuck then just write a little list of them now there's some examples on there for you she can move along that corridor like lightning and also this female ogre so these are two quotations used to describe the matron just a quick note there as well you can see that noun lightning you can see that it doesn't have an e there um l-i-g-h-t n-i-n-g i know lots of you just quick spag chest check lots of you like to spell lightning like with an e between the t and the n um we're not thinking light lightening as in something's getting lighter but lightning you think it happens really fast like lightning okay so she could move along that corridor like lightning so think about what that tells you about her she's very stealthy clearly i mean to think also this female ogre so have a think well, how does that present her so write down or highlight any memorable quotes that you learned about the matron whilst reading this chapter Okay, next, those of you that like to draw, this is your time to shine. I'd like you to try and draw yourself a picture of the matron and label her with your memorable quotations. And I want you to have at least six because I've given you two for free. You only need four more. I want you to draw a picture of the matron using Roald Dahl's descriptions. So you might have to flip back through, might have to replay part of the audiobook if you need to. Try and think what does she look like and if you're terrible at drawing like i am and that's absolutely fine maybe draw a little stick woman um it doesn't have to be particularly accurate you could even if you really 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 don't want to draw do a little um mind map instead thinking about these quotations and do little thought bubbles off of it and thinking about what that shows you about her so the fact that she is like a female ogre what does that tell you about her height maybe maybe her physical appearance if she's quite like lightning as i said she's very stealthy so i want you to if you can draw a picture of her if you don't want to you can do a little mind map and now, just like we did with Cider of Rosie last lesson, we're going to do a table and then write some PQAs about the matron. So we're going to start with these two quotations that you've got on here, and then you're going to do exactly what we did last lesson. Think about the point and then think about the analysis. You need to be thinking about using these quotations, what we learn about the matron, and you're going to be thinking what methods does Roald Dahl use to present the matron. So does he use similes? Does he use nouns? Does he use adjectives? Does he use metaphors? This female ogre, for example, is a metaphor. Um, and I want you to think about what the effect is of those. And if you need to, you can always underline, just like on the side of a rosy table, the most important word in your chosen quotation, and then analyse that particular word and think about what the effect of it is. Is he trying to present the matron as this really lovable, kind, considerate character, or is he presenting her as something else? I want you to have a think about that. And now, what you're going to try and do is turn your table into PQAs. And I mentioned last lesson that hopefully you're going to be sending these PQAs to your teacher for some feedback. So you're, if you don't know how to email your teacher, the instructions will be on Show My Homework. I want you to try and aim for three PQAs. And just in case you don't remember, it has been a very long time since we were at school, maybe since you've written some PQAs. The P stands for the point. So your point is how and what method does Roald Dahl use to describe the matron? So you can see here, Roald Dahl uses a simile to describe the matron. That's your point, okay? Your quotation is just what you're going to take exactly from the text. So it says, he says she could move along that corridor like lightning. And your analysis, and this is the bit that's tricky, is showing how your quotation proves your point so how does Roald Dahl use that simile to describe the matron and what does he describe her as so you can see here the noun lightning makes the matron sound very fast and like she acts without warning lightning can also be very dangerous when it strikes this might imply that the matron can also strike without warning and be dangerous 
Okay, so that's one that's been done for you. I want you to try and do three more and then email them to your English teacher for some feedback. Now, it's going to be up to your English teacher to decide whether they want to give you a grade or give you just a what went well and an even better riff. But uh, really, really important that you get in touch with your English teacher and you let them know because then if you've been doing some fabulous work, they want to know about it and they want to be able to pass on feedback to your parents, to your teachers, to your tutors that you've been working really, really hard. Okay, so and again, like I said earlier, even if you look at this and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing, I don't know how I'm going to do this. First thing you need to do is go back and have a look at your one from last lesson, your one with we did decide with Rosie, and there's the example on the last lesson's one. Let's look at the example on this slide, think about the PQA that's on here, how can you replicate that? You might even be able to use the sentence structures of the one that's on the PowerPoint right now. And then I want you to think about how you're going to write three of your own. And email it through to your teacher. And if you're very stuck, as I said, please email them anyway and just ask for help. Okay, and then last thing to do this lesson is to self-assess. So I want you to have a think. Are you a grade one? Are you a grade two? Are you a grade three? You will remember from when we were at school what grade you had last received in English. And you should be thinking about what grade you're going to aim for and hopefully move towards. So have a look at the PQAs that you've written. If you are a grade one, then you can make comments about quotes from the extract. So you could say... The matron moves like lightning. Lightning is very fast. That would you be being you making comments about quotes from the extract. Grade two would be able to make comments from the extract, but also using terminology. So you might say she moves like lightning. This simile shows that she moves very quickly. And then grade three finally would be able to make comments about quotes from the extract using terminology. So that's methods like similes, metaphors, but also zooming in on key words. So with you were a grade three, you will have written something like what was on the previous slide. You might have written she moves like lightning. This is a simile that shows that she moves very quickly, but also lightning is very dangerous. And therefore, this could suggest that not only is she quick, she's also very dangerous. OK, so have a look at the PQAs that you've written. Have a think. Would you, do you receive a grade one, a grade two or a grade three? And when you've done that and you've given yourself a grade, as I said, make sure that you email it off to your teacher and then hopefully you'll we'll hear back from them. We'll get some feedback um, and let you know roughly what they think you've done well, what they think you could improve on um, for next time you do a PQA. When you've done that and you've emailed it off to your teacher, you can either pause the video here and then come back to it another day or you can carry on through to lesson 18. Okay, now last lesson of this video, and we're going to be looking at Lowood and St. Peter's. So we're going to be comparing the presentation of boarding schools in both Jane Eyre, which is a novel by Charlotte Bronte, and comparing that to Boy by Roald Dahl. So although Boy is semi-autobiographical, as we spoke about before, it's based on the true story, this boarding school that we're going to have a look at in from a Victoria novel called Jane Eyre is actually a piece of fiction. So we're going to be comparing the presentation of two boarding schools. Now we've compared schools previously but they've not both been boarding schools so we're going to be comparing today a boarding but two boarding schools against each other so we're going to be looking at Lowood from Jane Eyre and St Peter's from Boy Okay, so our learning objective there is to compare the presentation of the two schools. Roald Dahl is sent away to boarding school, and this is a mark of his privileged upbringing. Notice, none of his sisters are sent away to school. So Roald Dahl is very lucky, and you might remember from the beginning of the um, the story, Roald Dahl spoke about the fact that his father was very set on his children going to English schools. Not only that, but Roald Dahl was sent to a boarding school. Now, boarding schools are really quite expensive, and this is the mark of his privileged upbringing. He's very wealthy. But in the text we're going to look at today, Jane Eyre is also sent away to boarding school. Now, her experience is very different to Roald Dahl's. And there's a YouTube video on and the link, the um, URL is on the slide in front of me. And this is from a, um, a film version of Jane Eyre. And the YouTube video explains why she's been sent to boarding school and what um, how she feels about it. So I'd like you to try and see if you can find that link. So you can you follow the um, URL, type it in on YouTube and then watch that video and it'll explain what Jane's experiences are like and why she is being sent to boarding school. So, just in case you didn't catch it, Jane is an orphan who is cared for by her aunt Reed, her mother's brother's wife, is a little bit of a mouthful, her mother's brother's wife, so her auntie. Uh, however, Jane's uncle is dead and her aunt is very unkind to her. She lets her own children bully Jane. Okay, so it reminds me a little bit of Cinderella um, and the ugly stepsisters. So, um, 
Jane's auntie being like the evil stepmother and then her stepsisters are her cousins. Okay, so they're very mean and they bully Jane. After Jane fights back when she is struck on the head by her cousin, so her cousin hits her on the head and Jane finally fights back, her auntie sends her away to Lowood School, which is a charity school. So it's not like Roald Dahl's family where he's very privileged and he's sent to school. Lowood School is a charity school. Here she meets other young girls abandoned by their families who no longer want to have them around the house. So all of the girls that have been sent to Lowood School have all been sent there by the families because they don't want them around anymore. So very different to Roald Dahl's experience. Okay, now as before, when we looked at Side with Rosie, the extract is in your home learning booklet. So we're going to be reading the extract from Jane Eyre when she first arrives at school. I'm going to read it to you, but if you want to get the, re the home learning booklet and you want to read along, then that's absolutely fine. And whilst we're reading, I want you to try and think what are the differences between this boarding school and the boarding school from Boy St. Peter's. Okay, Miss Miller was... More ordinary, ruddy in complexion, though of a careworn countenance, hurried in gait and action, like one who had always a multiplicity of the tasks on hand. She looked, indeed, what I afterwards found she really was, an under-teacher. So now there are probably lots of words in those, that sentence that you don't really understand, but she's saying that she was more ordinary, ruddy in complexion, though of a careworn countenance. So her face and her facial expressions are quite worn. She looks like she's been aged, probably more th older than she is. She's hurried in gait and action. She always had lots of tasks. She was very busy. So you can imagine her looking very stressed, very worn. Maybe she's got big bags under her eyes. Led by her, I passed from compartment to compartment, from passage to passage, to of a large and irregular regular building, till, emerging from the total and somewhat dreary silence pervading that portion of the house we had traversed, we came upon the hum of many voices, and presently entered a wide long room with great deal tables, two at each end, on each of which a burnt pair of candles, and seated all around on benches a congregation of girls of every age, from nine or ten to twenty. Seen by the dim light of the dips, their number to me appeared countless, though not in reality exceeding eighty. They were uniformly dressed in brown stuffed frocks of quaint fashion and long hollowed pinafores. It was the hour of study. They were engaged in conning over their tomorrow's task, and the hum I had heard was the combined result of their whispered repetitions. Now you've got a little picture um, up top here of um in your home learning booklet of the girls in their dresses in the pinafores that's described in that little extract that we've just read and you can see there are 80 girls in total and um jane is being led through the girls and it, she says it seems like there's hundreds of them there's countless numbers of them but actually there aren't more than 80 but they're all dressed in the same way okay it says um they were uniformly dressed in brown stuff frocks of quaint fashion and long holland pinafores Miss Miller signed to me to sit on a bench near the door, then walking up to the top of the long room, she cried out, Monitors, collect the class and books and put them away. Four tall girls arose from different tables, and going round, gathered the books and removed them. Miss Miller again gave the word of command. Monitors, fetch the supper trays. The tall girls went out and returned presently, each bearing a tray with portions of something, I knew not what, and arranged thereon, and a pitcher of water and a mug in the middle of each tray. The portions were handed around. Those who liked took a draught of the water, the mug being common to all. When it came to my turn, I drank, for I was thirsty, but did not touch the food. Excitement and fatigue rendering me incapable of eating, I now saw, however, that it was a thin oaten cake shared into fragments. The meal over, prayers were read by Miss Miller, and the classes filed off, two and two upstairs. Overpowered by this time of weariness, I scarcely noticed what sort of place the bedroom was, except that, like the schoolroom, I saw that it was very long. Tonight I was to be Miss Mellow's bedfellow. She helped me to undress. When laid down, I glanced at the long row of beds, each of which was quickly filled with two occupants. In ten minutes, the single light was extinguished, and amidst silence and complete darkness, I fell asleep. Okay, so we've read that extract then. What we need to think about now is what your impression of Lowood School is compared with St. Peter's, the Roald Dahl School. Now, as I said last lesson, you might need to go back and reread the descriptions of St. Peter's, but you have got some information from the chapter that you've just read recently on the matron. So I want you to think, are they similar or are they different? Think about the way that they were shared, they were given food, the way that the, there were monitors, the way that um, everybody did everything almost like clockwork and everybody was very, very um, 
strict and they followed the rules to a T. So I want you to have a think. What is your first impression of it? Does it sound like a nice place? Does it sound like somewhere that you would like to go to school? Maybe you're thinking, oh, I really can't wait to get back to Braden. Now, as I said before, good writers don't write for the sake of it. They write because they want to get a reaction. They aim to produce an effect. Now, I want you to have a think. Where in the extract is there surprise, shock, tension, sympathy or interest? Maybe when Jane is telling you about the long room and she says, I don't really understand it at first. Maybe you're interested there. Maybe you want to find out more. Maybe when she, you hear that there are 80 girls all in one room together. And very, very rarely do we have that many people together, maybe for an assembly, but definitely not for a lesson. Do we have 80 people together so maybe that's some shock there for you maybe when the uh, miss miller is shouting maybe that might create some tension maybe you're thinking about the food that they have this oat and cake that's been split into little bits and they're only allowed to take a piece each and they just have some water so we need to think what effect is created at each point of this um extract and if you want to and you've got um a paper copy or if you want to highlight in different colors on your word document then you absolutely can and think about what these what the effect is of each sentence used in this extract so in your workbook, you've got a table and it says using the table, compare the students, teachers, food and privacy in Lowood School and St. Peter's. You can find comparative quotes from the three chapters we have read so far. So you've got, and they've been done for you on this table very kindly, you've got some quotations that tell you about the students, that tell you about the teachers, the food and the privacy. So I want you to have a look back through the three chapters that you've read so far on St. Peter's. And you might need to use the audio book or you might need to get up the PDF. PDF copy, but I want you to try and compare them and think how are the students described in St. Peter's, how are the teachers described, how, the, how is the food described, what's the privacy like. And you can see here the students are uniformly dressed in brown stuff frocks of quaint fashion, stiff frocks I think it's supposed to say, and long holland pinafores. Teachers hurried in gait and action like one who had always a multi multiplicity of tasks on hand. How are the teachers described differently to that of those in, in boy. So you're going to have to go back if you've got the physical copy of the book, go and find those three chapters and find some quotations that tell you about each of these things. You need to pause the video to do that because it will probably take you a little bit of time. OK, now now your task is to write two paragraphs comparing the two schools. So you need to pick which one you want to talk about. Do you want to talk about the students, the teachers, the food or the privacy in the two schools? And I want you to think about how they're different. And you've got some sentence starters on here to help you. So it should be very, very simple. Pick which two of those you want to talk about out of the four the options that are on there. Do you want to talk about the students? Do you want to talk about the teachers, the food or the privacy? So pick the quotations that you're most confident about and then use these sentence starters to help you. So I'll give you an example. You could say the food in the two schools is very different. In Jane Eyre, it says, and then you can see we've got the dot, 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 dot. You can use that quotation, a thin oaten cake shared into fragments, which shows us maybe that there isn't very much food to go around. That it's been, if, the, you could, if you wanted to, you could talk about the fact that the fragments is very small pieces. Then you're going to compare that to boy and you're going to say, whereas in boy, it says, and then you can put your quotation in that you found about the food from boy. And you're going to think, what does that show us? Is the food spare, sparse? Is there lots of food available for the, the boys at um, St. Peter's school? Think about their tuck boxes, maybe things like that. OK, and then you're going to finish it off by saying overall, maybe which sounds like a more pleasant place to be in. When you've done that first paragraph, then you can pick a different point to talk about. So do you want to talk about students, teachers, privacy, food, it's up to you. And so you're going to write two paragraphs in total. You can see in your home learning booklet, you've got space to do that there as well. And then finally, I want you to think, is boarding school, does it sound good or bad? And again, you've got a little table in your home learning book, and this has got good points and bad points. So I want you to see, can you think of three for either? Three for good points, three for bad points. Sometimes I think being away from family would be really, really bad. And then sometimes I think being away from family would be really, really good. So I want you to have a think. Overall, do you like the idea of being at boarding school or do you think it sounds horrible? Maybe some of you have got older brothers and sisters that are at boarding school. What are their experiences? Have they enjoyed it? Maybe you, your parents went to boarding school, or your grandparents. Maybe you might have the opportunity to ask them if you're stuck at home with them. So I want you to have a think, is boarding school a good idea or a bad idea? Is it, does it sound like something you would like to do? Now, when you've done that, you've finished this lesson. Um, 
in the next lesson that you're going to do that you'll, it will be on Show My Homework next week will actually be about Roald Dahl's experiences with boarding school and what, whether he thinks it's good or bad. Maybe sometimes he begins to miss, miss home. How does he deal with that experience and how does he deal with missing home? So really well done for your work today. Like I said, don't forget to email if you haven't done already your PQA from last lesson to your teachers and have a great rest of the week.